Well, when we were worshiping, I began just uh, hearing this in my heart. And then Pastor Rob said what he said about strength. And I said, oh, I guess I'm supposed to give this to me. The Lord says, uh, remember that the joy of the Lord is your strength. And you say, how shall I recover that joy, Lord? And I say to you to stop listening to the lies of your enemy. And remember me, I am the Lord, your God, the faithful God who keeps covenant and mercy with them that love me. And I see that you love me, says the Lord, and I want to say to you that I am with you, and I, if you continue to walk with me and gather together, then I will lead you and fulfill my good words of promise to you. But remember, as you go on this journey to victory, that the joy of the Lord is your strength. Amen. You know, the um, whenever we're outside, I don't know about you, I know that we're, we don't want to be outside, but since the beginning of the early church, Jesus brought the Holy Spirit so people could go outside the four walls. Amen. So whether we like it or not, this is what God wants us to do, is to bring the gospel outside. We have a great church building, and I know that the devil wants to say, okay, you guys you guys can't meet inside, or whatever that might be, and the strategy of, of hell is to quench and kill Jesus. But every time that happens, the Bible says it just spreads. The good news spreads into the four corners of the earth. And so let's preach the good news, right? Amen? To every creature. And so there are some creatures that need Jesus today, like me. Anybody need Jesus? So my question that I want to that I've been asking myself is, and maybe like yourself in the in this time and in this climate that we live in, and in this incredible city that we live in that is sometimes hard to really understand, my question that I've been asking is how can I make a difference? How can I bring change? How can me, Josh, who I don't feel very significant? How can I change the course? And as Socrates said, how can I make the change? How can I do something here? And, uh, and as I was praying about it, I'm reading the Bible, and I believe that God gave me a word, and I believe that God wants to use you, say me, me. to bring change. And so I heard this testimony. This is, I believe, exactly what we're talking about and what I want to preach on. And I heard this testimony about a man that came to our church years ago. And this man, when he came to church, uh, had some pre-existing conclusions. <laughs> some pre-existing conclusions about what church is and what church people are like. And pre-existing conclusions about himself and the past that he had and some of the mistakes that he had made in life or some of the areas that he had come and his pre-existing conclusions coming to church are that church people are judgmental. We never thought that, right? When you Before you came to church, you never thought that church people were judgmental. Holier than thou, perfect people with no problems, exclusive, uncaring, and probably going to be critical, right? That's Has anybody ever thought that way before? I thought that way when I was like two years old, right? Okay. When I got in trouble in children's church. And so this guy was about to walk out, and a man in our church stopped him and invited him over for dinner. And he said, that moment changed my life, it changed my perspective, it changed my direction. And if that didn't happen, he would have never come back and possibly never experienced a relationship with God and the life that God has for him. But since he did... That man, who we know as Angel Frias, is part of our family. And so when I heard that story, and the person and the man that invited him over for dinner was none other than Mr. Joe Peterson himself. And so I asked Joe, I said, Joe, um, do you remember that? 
Do you remember saying it? It's like, I, have, I don't remember. And that's probably even more special, is it wasn't like a big deal. It was just normal, MO, this is what I do. If I just invite people over to be a part of our life. And so how do we make a difference in our community? And how do we help people that are lost and they're hurting have an experience of change in their mindset? What we're going to find out is from the story of Jesus. Now, the story that we're going to read today is Luke chapter 24. We're going to start in verse 13. And so, if you know the, if you know where this takes place, this is after Jesus has died on the cross, after he has risen from the dead, he has just conquered sin, death, the grave. Every foe has been defeated. This is the most victorious moment in all of human history. History has changed. We're talking about resurrection, death is defeated, power. So that all of us, from this point on, our sins are no longer have bonded, you know, control over us. We can be free, and we can experience a relationship with God. Jesus just did this, and this is what he talked about. This is what the Bible predicted. This is all of history to this moment. This is like, this is the center focus of all history. And so Jesus has just experienced the resurrection power, and two of his disciples totally miss it. And their mindset is off. And they are lost, and they are depressed, they are sad, they are totally oppressed in their heart, and they're not only discouraged and sad, they are walking in the wrong direction. They are, as we would see our society, going the wrong direction, away from God, away from the will of God, away from the plan and the joy and the power that God has for their life. So let's read this. That very day, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and they were talking with each other about all the things that had happened. And when they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went to them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, What is this conversation that you are holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still, looking sad. Then one of them named Cleopas answered him, Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened here in these days? And he said, What things? And they said to him concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty indeed, and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things happened. Moreover, some women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning. And when they did not find his body, they came back saying that they had even seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the woman had said, but him they did not see. And he said to them, O foolish ones, this is Jesus now talking to these guys, his disciples, that O foolish ones and slow of heart to believe all the prophets had spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So they drew near to the village where they were going. He acted as if he was going further. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is now far spent. So he went in to stay with them. And when he was at table with them, he took the bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to them. And their eyes were open and they recognized him and he vanished from their sight. And they said to each other, did not our hearts burn within us when he talked to us on the road while he opened to us the scriptures? And they rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem and they found the eleven and those who were with them gathered together saying, the Lord has risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. I want to look at, first of all, just because. Because we're talking about how we can make a difference and how we can make a difference in our community, in our world, in our nation. And I want to say just because, because what opens the eyes of the blind? What opens the eyes of the deceived? These disciples were blind. They were deceived. They were hurting. What brings understanding and a change of heart to those lost in darkness? 
traveling in the wrong direction, far from the will of God, going away from God, tormented and controlled by fear. Isn't that what people are to, controlled by fear? Yet knowing the facts, yet not understanding them. And I want to say this, is just because Jesus has come into our lives, and we've come to the light. I don't know about you, but when Jesus came into my life, my life got light. It was like the lights turned on, and joy came into an angry, frustrated, mean person. When Jesus came in, the way, the truth, and the life, it doesn't always mean that just because God has touched our lives, it doesn't mean that just because we have the answer, it doesn't mean that people are going to listen. It doesn't mean that our nation, just because you have Jesus, doesn't mean that Santa Monica has Jesus. It doesn't mean that they're going to listen to what you have to offer. Just because the Bible has the answers doesn't mean that people are actually going to receive those answers. Just because it's the truth doesn't mean that people get it or understand it or see it. And so I had this, I had this thought a while ago, and it's actually a conviction for me. To notice a problem is the low-hanging fruit. I can point out everybody, well, you could probably point out my problems in, in like no time at all, right? It's easy to point out somebody else's problem. Hello? Yeah. All right, we're good at that, right? We can point out the problems in our city and I'll point out our problems. I mean, I can drive down the street and point out problems all over the place. That's the low-hanging fruit. It's easy to find the problem. And we are professional problem pointer outers. Think about what your mind is always thinking about. You're pointing out problems. The problem with churches, the problem with that person, the problem with my parents, the problem with my siblings, the problem with my boss, the problem with Santa Monica. I mean, most people call this place paradise, but we can find problems in Santa Monica. The problem with this and the problem with that. And we are professional problem pointer outers. That's the easy, low-hanging fruit. Come on now. Amen? The next level, in my experience, is that you can find the problem and you have a great solution. Here's the problem. The second level of like effort is like trying to find a solution to the problem. What I think the answer to the problem is, oh, that's a really good answer to the problem. That's the next level. you got to go a little higher on the tree to pick that fruit. But even, I don't know about you, but have you ever had a really, really good conversation with somebody that is going through something hard, and you think, man, I just gave them the answer. I just gave them the solution to their problem. Sweet, I changed their mind, but then you realize nothing changes. I'm sure that's how my parents felt with me growing up. Amen, right, Dad? All right. I remember I'd have conversations with my grandfather who's in heaven. I'd even take notes. But because I wasn't in a place to hear anything he said, I even wrote down the answers. And a decade later, I remember going back to those notes and realized that he gave me all the answers that I needed. But I didn't have a care to even listen. And I thought, man, how frustrating that must have been for him. But the most difficult most difficult issue for our life is to care enough about someone that they care about what you're saying. Oh, that's how I know I'm preaching the right thing. Issues. And as I think back about how much effort it took with Markel, I thought, man, that's a lot of work. That's a lot of money. That's a lot of food. That's a lot of sweat. That's a lot of tears. That's a lot of emotions. That's a lot of love. But as I look back, I say that was worth it. But whoa, that was really hard. If you want to see a difference in someone's life, for someone to actually receive from you or me or to be able to hear the answer, they actually have to care about what you're saying. They actually have to know, to really know, to totally know, completely know that you care. You could be totally right and no one hears what you say. You know, Jesus, the Bible says, died while we were still sinners. Do you realize Jesus died when we were absolutely going the wrong direction? He said, I care about you enough that Jesus died. 
The price was paid. Access to God was granted. Miracles, supernatural. But until you care, you will never experience that new life, change life until you say, you know what, I care enough. That, that price has been paid. It's offered to every single one of us. But until we care enough to, to grab the ticket, to say, yes, God, I receive, the answer is there. But will we access the answer? It, it's all dependent on whether or not we care enough to go for it. And so at some point, for the lost to know, to hear, to see, they have to know that we care enough. Now I want to look at the road to recognition. Because here are these disciples who are sad. They're discouraged. They're talking about Jesus, his death, and all that had happened. They talked about what was going to happen. And Jesus comes up to them in verse 17 and he says, what are you guys talking about? And they stood still and they're looking sad. They're that when they said, it says they're looking sad that in the, in the Greek, it says they're gloomy, they're depressed, they're angered, they're sullen, they're struggling, they're dejected. And they're feeling this burden. And Jesus says, what are you guys talking about? And there are a few things in this conversation, in this moment, that I want, I think it's good for us to recognize on this road to recognition. The fact, the first fact here in this, in this truth is that God is at work. So here's these guys and they're depressed and they're frustrated. And I don't care where you are in life today. Maybe you're frustrated that, that maybe you see things going downhill. Maybe you're frustrated because you feel lost. Maybe you're sad today because you feel like there is a, there's a heartbreak. We are all dealing with the losses, especially this week. But one thing that God always says through the word of God is that just because it doesn't look good from our point of view, God is still at work. Let me tell you, God is at work right now. You got to believe that. God is at work right now. And just because you don't see it, you know what? You're not God. You're not going to see it. You're not going to see all that God is doing. And Jesus goes to them and he says, he says, what's going on? And they go, are you the only one that doesn't know anything? To Jesus. And Jesus goes, what things are you talking about? Now, when I read that, is we think we know what's going on. Everybody here thinks they know what's going on. We think what is important, what burdens, what depresses us, what scares us, what torments us, is what really is important. And Jesus asked this question. I began to think about this question that Jesus asked and it began to dawn on me. I wonder if he's either trying to get him to talk about it, but also subtly, subtly saying, hey guys, what things are you talking about? He goes, what things are you talking about? He's trying to say, there's a lot of other things that are going on that you don't see. So what things are you specifically all bummed out about? And they're like, you don't know anything because you don't know about this one event And here's the fact, God is working right now all around us and he's doing great things and he's doing big things and there's doing things that we don't know. And just because the news that we listen to or watch says that this is important, it doesn't mean that that's what God thinks is important. It doesn't mean that God isn't doing bigger, better, more important miracles behind the scenes. Jesus says, what things? One of the credible stories in the Bible is the story of the demoniac that got delivered by Jesus. In Mark chapter 15, um, <clears throat> I'm going to look this up here. I'm on my, my iPad, so it takes a little bit of time. I don't, it's not... Mark chapter 5, verse 19, the story of the demoniac. The Bible says that he went into, that Jesus went into this special area called the Gadarenes. And there was this guy that met him who was like tormented with demons. He was all messed up. And Jesus delivered him. And when he got delivered, he was sober. He was in his right mind. He got totally, totally recovered. And he goes, Jesus, I'm going to follow you. And so Jesus says, no, no, no. I want you to stay here. And in verse 19, there's a really interesting statement that Jesus makes. He says, the Bible says that Jesus did not permit him to come with, but said to him, go home to your friends and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. And he went away and began to proclaim in Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him and everyone marveled. 
The first thing that Jesus said is tell everybody how much God has done for you. How much he's created, how much he's fashioned, how he's authored something out of nothing. That's what that means. How much he's done means to, to bring something out of nothing and that God did something. You know, we like to tell other people what to do, but before you tell anybody what to do, why don't you tell them what Jesus has done for you? Oh, goodness gracious. I'm so excited. Has Jesus ever done anything for you? See, we want to give everybody the answer, but why don't you tell them what God did? That I was a jerk, man. <laughs> I was a rebel. I was a liar. I was a thief. And Jesus saved me. And people actually said that I'm, say that I'm a happy, nice person now. That is a miracle. Can I tell you that Jesus healed my wrist? It was broken. I couldn't lift anything. I would have never surfed. I would have never been able to, etch. but yet God did a miracle. I would have never been able to go, but God healed my, God did something for me. You know, maybe we need to tell people what God's done for us. You know, who wants to be told what to do? But why don't you tell God, people what God's done for you? Like, we serve a pretty good God. There's some really cool, st see, we look pretty, you know, holy right now. But there's miracles sitting in your seat. And Jesus says, just go tell people, don't tell them what to do. Just go tell them what God's done for you. And if, and if you'd say, oh, I don't know if God's ever done anything, we can pray for you and God can do a miracle for you right now. He can bring peace into that heart. He can bring joy. That's what Jesus said, so that you know that I have the power to forgive sins, rise up and walk. He said, I'm gonna do a miracle in your body so that you know that I can take care of every problem in your life. You know, Jesus has saved us and he wants people to experience that too. And the second thing Jesus says is he goes, go tell them that you've experienced mercy. You know, mercy means undeserved favor. You know, have you ever heard anybody say, like, how are you doing? And you say, I'm doing better than I deserve. It's like a cliche, right? I'm doing better than I deserve. Well, that's the truth. I'm going to tell you right now, you're doing better than you deserve right now. I remember one time I got, dis I got in trouble and um, <clears throat> I, got, I got spanked and I, I was like, dad, I didn't do it. And he goes, well, that was for all the times that you got away with it. <laughs> it's like, well, uh, yeah, I guess that's true. You know, like the logic there is like all the things I got away with, like far outweigh what I got in trouble for. Think about it for you. All the times that you speed versus your tickets. Hello, right now you are living the life of grace. All the times that you should have gotten sick and you didn't get sick. All the times that you didn't wash your hands, you know, all the things. You know, some of us are really self-righteous and we think we're really like good, but you are so blessed. Mercy of God upon your life. Can you imagine if God judged you for every single thing you did wrong? We'd all be dead. It'd be like nobody alive, right? We'd probably live to like six months years old and then we'd have a temper tantrum and then that would be it. But God said to this man, he says, go tell everybody how much mercy you've received. You know, we like to boast about, this is kind of the spicy part. We like to boast about how good God is and what God can do for somebody else's life. But very few of us like to be vulnerable and talk about how we are really sinners saved by grace. You know, I want to tell you how to live your life, but it's really hard for me to say, you know what? Let me tell you about all the issues that I have. About how... How much of a, I remember I tell stories about things that I've done and I'm so embarrassed because I'm like, I can't believe I did those things. I can't believe that I'm such a jerk. I can't believe that I'm that mean. I can't believe that this guy did that. Oh, it's, it's like, it makes me writhe in pain. It makes me sick to my stomach to think that I hurt people that I love and I said things that I, oh, I don't even want to think about it. I have a really good eraser for my memory for how, how much of a bad person I am without Jesus. But Jesus says to the demoniac, he says, demoniac, he goes, tell them how you've experienced God's mercy. Because that's what's going to change our, people can say, hey man, if God can save you, hey, there's hope for me. So the fact is that God is doing things. 
And we like to be deserving based on our own merit. But this guy, the demoniac, went to 10 cities. Decapolis means 10 cities. And everybody marveled. They were astonished because he talked about what God did for him and how he experienced mercy. The second fact we see on the road to recognition is we don't actually see and know everything God is doing. You know, they had no idea that Jesus was alive and very much well, and he was standing right in front of their face. Jesus was in the action of trying to bring them a revelation, but they couldn't see it. And he said, foolish ones means thoughtless, not understanding. You're not thinking, you're unmindful of the things of God. How often do we think we know what God is doing or what's going on? You know, the devil thought that he had defeated Jesus, defeated God. The devil thought that the cross was his final victory. The battle was won. Hell had a party on Friday night. Hell was like, yes! And Jesus broke the power of sin and death. And on the third day, Sunday came, victory over fear, failure, sin, sickness, death, hell, Satan was defeated and completely defeated. The Bible says in Romans 8, and we know that for those who love God, all things, say that with me, all things, work together for good. Say for good. All things for good. Maybe you guys need some, you need need a tan. Maybe that's why we're outside. Maybe you need some fresh air. Maybe your Christianity is stuck in a box and you need to get outside. But in verse 37 in Romans 8, Dad, you like this verse. Now in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. And I'm sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. You know, Daniel went to the lion's den, not to die a terrible death, but that God would be exalted and Daniel would experience God's blessing. Esther went before the king, not to risk her life to be killed, but to save her nation and they would experience blessing like never before. Goliath threatened Israel, not that Israel would be overrun, but that Israel led by David would be delivered from the Philistines. Jesus went to the cross not to be defeated, but that salvation from sin, resurrection, life, and power could be available for all people. The third fact on the road to recognition is that information doesn't change hearts. Let me say that again. Information doesn't change hearts. Jesus told them everything from Moses to the prophets. Do you guys know what that means? That's the whole Old Testament. Every reference about Jesus, he told them about himself, standing in front of them, every reference. That is the most information. That must have been, I'm going to go back and I'm going to listen to that podcast or YouTube video of Jesus telling everything. That must have been the greatest sermon ever preached. But the problem was, is they did the whole journey all day long. Jesus gave them every understanding of how he was fulfilled and what was going on was in the Bible and they still didn't get it. It was a revelation to me. Just telling people the truth, even explaining every every single powerful supernatural fact, telling people the truth and then the extended version of the truth with notes and diagrams, every verse, every argument, every explanation, The Bible says even later that they even said our hearts were burning. That means that their heart felt the truth, but it didn't change their hearts and it didn't open their eyes. I I just want to say this right now. This could be the best sermon ever preached. (laughs) This is what encouraged me. I could be bringing it like fire. (laughs) Wow. The Holy Ghost could be right here, right now, just demolishing arguments and principalities. I could be an oracle from heaven, bringing information. But your eyes might not be open. It's it's like discouraging. What opened their eyes? What made them into listeners, hearers, understanders? What made them an audience? What made the difference? There's a pastor that 
Pastor Jorge Espinoza, he's in Wendover, Utah slash Nevada. We used to have a Bible study every single Saturday morning at McDonald's <laughs> over, our, over our Egg McMuffins and coffee. And we covered some really good stuff. In fact, some of the notes from those Bible studies that I had with Pastor George Espinoza before he was a pastor, I look back and like, those are like revelations from God. Some of that stuff I still use in sermons. It's like, man, God was speaking, but it didn't make a difference. He still made decisions and he looked back and, he, and what he said to me was years later, he goes, you know, Pastor Josh, you know what made the difference? He's like, that we had egg McMuffins and coffee at McDonald's. I'm like, don't you remember? He's like, I, I don't really remember anything we talked about. <laughs> I was like, man, I spent hours preparing, like, the word of God dividing joint and marrow. But you know what made the difference was that we had egg McMuffins and we met. And that's what spoke to me. And this is the secret to making a difference. How many people want to help people see Jesus? How many people want to make a difference in our community? The first question is, do they want you around? I just lost some folks right now. Do they even want you around? Because the Bible says in verse 29 that they strongly urge Jesus to stay with them. They said, you know what? Something about this guy we really like and we want you to hang out with us even more. Jesus just spent the whole day with them. And usually if you spend the whole day like on a road trip with somebody, you're like, I need some space. <laughs> you ever been in the car with somebody for hours and hours and you're like, you go to your house and your room and I'm just gonna go wherever you are not. <laughs> I need some space. And the disciples said to Jesus, we want you to stay with us longer. You know, we always hear that well, we remember that verse that says bad company corrupts good morals. Or maybe it's a paraphrase. But maybe people want to hang out with you because you've loved them, helped them, and they like you. And maybe God has given you an open door to bring the good news into their life. Maybe they want to hang out with you because God wants to help them through you. Here's a question. Do lost, hurting, sad, fearful, deceived people want you around? It's going to be really hard to bring Jesus and to bring hope if they don't want you around. I don't know about you, but that should speak to you right now. Jesus spent all day with them and they want him around. So the first thing is, ask yourself the question, do they want you around? The Bible says that Jesus was requested. I did a Google search, how to, how to make a difference in somebody's life. Number one, earn their trust, know their influences. Another Google search, is it possible to change someone's mind? And it says one particular effective way of breaking down barriers and changing someone's mind is by becoming their friend. I did another search, how to talk to someone who won't listen. I'm a principal, you know, you always wonder about create a, the answer is create a meaningful relationship with them. Jesus did that. You know, in my life, when God began to change my life, there were some of the greatest influences in my, in my life were my dad, Pastor Bill Neal and uh, Dave Crawford. And I remember I was in tough spots. I don't really remember the words they spoke to me, but I do remember the powerful El Abajeno burrito. I remember all the carne asada. I remember the surf trips. I remember Dave teaching me the technique of grilling chicken and how to make a bad hot dog taste good. He said the true talent of a good grill master is when you can make a bad hot dog taste good. I remember when he showed me when he lifted up his cheese and he put peppers all over it. And I thought that's how you were supposed to eat pizza. And I couldn't taste for three days. My, fa my mouth was burned. I learned how to face my fears and eat tablespoons of jerk sauce. They spent time with me and my eyes were opened. <laughs> and my pores. <laughs> and other things. <laughs> they spent time with me. Let me ask you this question. Do you have what it takes to hang out? 
Number one, do you have time to hang out? Because Jesus spent a whole day with his disciples who were lost, hurting, discouraged. And he said they were foolish. He's like, you guys, man, I just spent like three years with you telling you everything. And yet you still don't understand. I got to spend a whole nother day with you. The Bible says that Jesus still had time to hang out. In verse 30, the Bible says when he was at table with them or when he was having dinner. And so the other part of this if having it, what it takes to hang out is, do you have the guts to be spiritual? You know, just hanging out with somebody doesn't make any difference in their life because you could hang out with them doing absolutely terrible things, but it takes guts to be spiritual. See, Jesus served, he, he took bread, he blessed it, he prayed, he gave gratitude. Thank you, God, for this bread. He broke it. There was sacrifice involved. And he divided what he had and he began to distribute it. He gave it away. The Bible says, for God so loved the world that he gave. This, in this moment, Jesus not just was hanging out with them, but he brought this spiritual dynamic. And the Bible says their eyes were opened. He spent time with them. But he was spiritual and their eyes were open. And the Bible says at the end of our text that when they were telling the disciples how Jesus was revealed, they said, when he had broken bread, our eyes were opened. Not when he told us everything. When he told us everything, our hearts were burning. But when he broke the bread, our eyes were open. When Jesus ministered to them and served them, they realized, oh my goodness. Everything became clear. And their eyes were open and he made a difference in their life and they changed direction and where they were going into depression and discouragement, they were going into sadness and fear. They turned around and they went back with vision and they began to tell people what Jesus had done in their life. It was like the combination of hospitality and eating together with the spiritual dynamic brought the revelation in their life. Let me ask you a question. Think about your life. There are some people here who have changed radically. How many people here that God has done a radical change in your life? <laughs> I thank God for what he's done in my life and how my mind has changed over time because of Jesus. But as I think about how my life has changed over time, I cannot disconnect the fact that somebody was loving me and hanging out with me and helping me through that whole process. Someone was bringing that spiritual dynamic in that relationship until the blinders came off. Can anybody here talk about what God has done in your life? I say, man, God has done, is there anybody here that says, you know what, God's done something for me? How many people say, you know, God's done something? I was, I was lost, man, I was nuts. And now I'm, I'm saved. Okay, I got one person, two, oh, come, come. Couple, couple of you, yeah? Are you willing to talk about it? Caitlin, you want to come talk about it? I'll give you like 30 seconds. Come here, come on, give me a, tell us what God has done in your life. Who were you? Now, Caitlin is up here. She's on the platform, right? So she must be super holy. This is a really holy person according to judgmental, but let, tell us what God has done for you. Um, uh, I spent most of my life, uh, not knowing God at all. Um, lots of partying, lots of different relationships, um, ended up busting my body and came to this church to a Spanish service for healing and was prayed for in the name of Jesus my body pain went away and then I came for another service and asked to receive God, specifically Jesus Christ take my life. And he took the spirit of depression from me. He took the spirit of anger from me. My mind was rescued. My heart was rescued. My body was rescued. I used to be a crazy, angry, angry woman. And now, I'm mostly joyful, but some t I still live in Santa Monica, so sometimes I get mad. <laughs> but he's done an unbelievable change in my life, and, and no one in my family is saved, but 
they know I'm different. Yeah. So. Yeah, thank you. Oh. Yeah. That's scary right there. How many people out there were crazy? How many people still are? Aren't you glad for Jesus? <laughs> Amen. Who took us? Sometimes we just got to testify and tell, us what, tell people what God's done. I want to close and I want to sum it up. And I want to ask some questions. How can we make a difference? Number one, do you have anything good to tell? What has God done for you? It will make a difference when we talk about what God has done for us. Do you have guts enough to be vulnerable and talk about the mercy that God has showed you? Here's a, here's a way to know. Ask somebody that you know and ask them, how often do you actually talk about Jesus and what he's done for you and what he's doing in your life? You want to know if you're, if that's the, ask somebody that knows you and say, how often do I talk about Jesus? Oh, you're a Christian? I didn't know that. <laughs> talk about what God's done for you. The prayers that he answered. The miracles that he's done. Secondly, do people want you around? That's kind of a hard one. Nobody likes me. Well, are you thoughtful? Are you considerate? Are you generous? Do you serve? Are you hospitable? Do you have time for them? Jesus is a pretty busy guy. You know, saving the world and everything. And yet he spent a whole day walking with these guys on a road trip, going the wrong direction, and then served them bread. Pretty cool guy right there. Because he cared about him. And finally, are you spiritual? This is scary. But how often do you go there where you actually say, I'm going to pray or bring up the Bible or bring up Jesus or actually go out on a limb and say, can I just pray for you? Can I bless you right now? Jesus went all in. And as soon as he did that, the eyes were open and he made a difference in their life. God wants to use you, say me, to make a difference. He puts you in this situation, in this city, in this job, in this family, in this community, in this crazy time, because you're the one that he knows that is going to make a difference. You are called for this time and you are anointed by God because you are the ones to make a difference. Let's make a difference in our world. Amen? Let's pray. God, we just thank you today for your grace. We thank you for your power. We thank you that you have had mercy on us and you have done incredible things in our life. God, we just thank you most of all that you came to this earth, that you died and you gave yourself so that we could be washed, so that we could be forgiven, so that we could be changed. And through your grace, through your power, our lives can be changed. God, we thank you that you made a difference in our life. Without you, we would be so different. And we just ask God that you would help us to be that light. Help us to be those that would make a difference in our city, in our nation, in our world today. And with our heads bowed, our eyes closed, perhaps you're here today and you don't know Jesus. And perhaps you're, you're not right with God. God wants you to know that he loves you. And he has a destiny for your life. We read the story about the demoniac. This guy was really messed up. He was so messed up that everybody had pushed him out of the city because he was abusive, not only to himself, but to everyone around. No chains could hold him. He was living alone. He was tormented. Yet Jesus saw him and he loved him and he went to him and he gave him freedom. And maybe you're here today and you say, man, if God could do that for him, there's hope for me. And God wants to touch your life. No matter where you've been, no matter what you've been through, no matter what you're going through, there's hope for your life because God loves you. Is there anybody here and you say, I, I, I want to try. I want to open the door to Jesus in my life. Is there anybody here? Lift up your hand and say, that's me. We want to pray for you. Maybe you're watching on the live stream. You say, that's me. We want to say a prayer. It's very simple to invite Jesus into our life. Say, dear Jesus, I thank you for your love, that you died on the cross and you rose again on the third day. I ask you to come into my life, 
forgive me of my sin. Help me. Change me. Do a new thing in my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. If you prayed that prayer for the first time and you're here, maybe you didn't raise your hand, come tell me after. We want to love to connect with you to help you in your in that new relationship if you pray that prayer the first time and you're on the live stream praise the lord welcome to the family of god we would love to connect with you make sure you click the link at the at the bottom of the screen but i want to ask a question because as people that care we want to make a difference and the first question we talked about is do we have anything good to tell have we been talking about god's mercy and what he's done in our life got to testify. Maybe you're here and you say, man, I, I find myself not really talking about God very much. If you want to make a difference, talk about God. Don't talk about your, you know, how smart we are. Talk about God. Secondly, do people want you around? What do we need to change? Are we thoughtful? Are we considerate? What can I change? And God's speaking to you about areas. Say, you know what? I, there's some things I need to change so people want to spend time. And finally, are you spiritual? How often do you go to spiritual matters? Do you go there? Let's get spiritual. Amen. We are those that make a difference. God's anointed you to be the one to make a difference. Amen. What an incredible God we serve. Aren't you thankful for Jesus? So good to see everybody. I like having church outside. I should have worn my sunscreen, so I'm feeling convicted right now. But um, praise the Lord. God's blessed us to live in a great place, to have an outdoor service. And it's actually probably cooler in here than it is out here than it is in there. All right. Until we get the air conditioning. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Amen. This week is coming in. Let's pray. God, we just thank you for this day. We thank you, God, that you made a difference in our life. Help us to be those that make a difference in our world, in our family, in our city, in our community. Help us to be those that would bring the good news to this sad and discouraged time in this community, in this place, in this generation. We pray your blessing upon this day. I pray your blessing upon each one of these incredible people today. God, your anointing and your power and your joy and your presence with each one of them as we go forth from this place and in this time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And God bless you. Church is at six tonight. God bless you.